Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be on planet Earth. Uh, we have the <clears throat> privilege <clears throat> for the next hour uh, to dive as deep as feasible and logistically uh, practical and possible <clears throat> onto some of the more cutting edge issues and challenges and opportunities uh, facing the United States relationship with its friends, uh, allies, and strategic partners in the 22 country uh, Arab region. Uh, we have at one and the same time, a military uh, political specialist, a career uh, officer of 37 years in the US Army Armed Forces <clears throat> with assignments and leadership roles in combat uh, situations in half a dozen countries uh, and a former commander of forces in Iraq uh, working with uh, the leadership capacity for uh, NATO and related uh, allies in Afghanistan, a former director of the United States Central Intelligence Agency, where he received a vote of 94 to zero approval in the United States uh, uh, Senate. Uh, General Petraeus is unusual in the sense of holding records of standing first in his class in various uh, military armed services institutions and colleges. He's a parachutist as well, and a ranger, and a graduate of the US Army's Command and General Staff College in Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. On top of that, he has his PhD in international <coughs> uh, affairs and relations from the Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Foreign Affairs. He's been uh, ongoingly involved as an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And he is a senior vice president of the Royal United Services Institution in Great Britain, uh, which lends further credibility uh, to his uh, emphasis on the multilateral aspect of America's relations with the world beyond our shores. <clears throat> we have uh, General Petraeus also as a member of the International National Council's International Advisory Board <clears throat> and a keynote speaker on several occasions previously for the National Council's Arab US Policymakers Conference for which this is the 30th anniversary. <clears throat> Interviewing, conducting a discussion with General Petraeus is the one and only Raghada Dirham. Raghada Dirham first came on to the international communications and print and broadcast media stage when she was 26 years old on the predecessor of the PBS News Hour, which used to be known as the McNeil Lara Show. And she was for more than a quarter of a century, the New York United Nations space correspondent for the El Hayat, London-based uh, uh, newspaper. She too is a member of the National Council's International Advisory Board. But of late, most importantly, she is a co-founder uh, with uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey El Faisal Al Saud <coughs> of the uh, Beirut Summit. And for the last uh, 14 months, or for rather from May of 2020 to July of 20. 1921, she convened uh, almost weekly uh, some 130 plus policymakers, problem solvers, opinion formulators uh, from uh, numerous uh, countries globally uh, to focus on <clears throat> the cutting edge issues of the day, General Petraeus being one of those uh, speakers <clears throat> that she was recruited. I know of no other international foreign affairs practitioner who has established a relationship of trust and confidence, <clears throat> of comfort and confidence, confidence uh, pertaining to East and West, North and South leaders. Please welcome General David Petraeus and his interviewer, Ms. Raghada Dirham. The floor is both of yours. Thank you so very much for this wonderful introduction, Dr. Anthony. Uh, it is an honor and a great privilege for me uh, that uh, this is the fourth conversation I would have with General Petraeus for 
the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations because it is such an important part of the Arab-U.S. policymakers conversation that is uh, look that looks forward and uh, positively and constructively on what we need to do always to make it better. Uh, thank you, Dr. jean Aduk Anthony, and thank you, Pat Massino. It's, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, this, this will always be a geopolitical conversation with uh, General Petraeus. Obviously, we will have to focus a little more on the region, on the Middle East region and the wider Middle East region. So forgive me if I go a little bit short on the important other matters uh, such as China uh, and American Chinese relations, but we will touch on all that. And so, uh, having uh, one hour ahead of us only, I'd like Jared Petraeus uh, to start with your permission uh, to address the issue of Afghanistan. Jared Petraeus, I know this is a very important issue to you, uh, and not only uh, in, 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 in the matter of politics, politics, but in the human dimension of it and in the dimension of the importance of the American role, global role of the United States of America. So um, I'm sure that you would want to speak about that, but I'll get into specifics with you once I give you a couple of minutes to say, tell us what you want us to learn from you at the offset of this conversation to you, General Petraeus. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for the kind introduction, John Duke. It's always great to be with the National Council. Thanks, Raghida, for doing this yet again. Um, look, I think the outcome in Afghanistan is a combination of, of heartbreaking. Um, it's tragic in many respects, and I think in, in a number of ways it is disastrous as well. Uh, that's not to say that the former Afghan government was perfect by any means. It had a huge number of shortcomings, uh, maddening features, corruption, all the rest of that. But I would submit that the fact that hundreds of thousands of people are trying to leave the new regime uh, gives an indication, you know, voting with one's feet and also with one's money. Uh, many of the those that had options uh, left already. There's quite a brain drain and all the rest. Right, and and sadly, what the Afghan people, nearly 38 or 39 million of them that are left, face is uh, very likely a, a degree of perpetual famine uh, and a true humanitarian catastrophe this winter in particular. Uh, the the harvest this year was uh, really quite uh, below that of normal years. Uh, the drought was assessed to be the worst in 35 years, although it seems as if with climate change, that those kinds of drought conditions are much more frequent, unfortunately, than every 35 years. But a country that used to be able to feed itself and, and gradually was able to do that less because of a migration to cities and so forth, um, it really had an abysmal harvest this year. Uh, it will desperately need all the help it can get from the World Food Program and a variety of other international aid organizations. But of course, there's a huge reluctance, I think an understandable reluctance uh, to unfreeze the assets that are frozen, uh, for example, in the United States, some 9 billion or so of uh, Afghan government assets uh, to allow the Taliban to have access to the IMF and the World Bank if they even had the expertise to know how to pursue that. Uh, and uh, the economy has collapsed. Uh, the uh, individuals, if they order in advance, can actually get maybe $200 uh, out of the bank uh, at, at a time. Uh, and so it's very, very uh, dire. And a country that imports most of its electricity uh, either from the Central Asian states or brings in refined fuel products from Iran to generate it, uh, will not be able to pay those bills. It is already not able. It's not able to pay the bills of its security forces. It's not able to pay the government salaries. All of this used to be paid by largely the US with some uh, help from Japan, the UK, and a handful of other donor nations. But the US generally paid about 75% of the budget. It paid all of the security forces, uh, all of their operating expenses, the equipment, training, and so forth. All of that is uh, no longer available. Uh, and the assets are frozen. So the situation uh, is very, very dire indeed. And, and ironically, the country that was celebrating to some degree the, the victory of the Taliban uh, and uh, taking over control of Kabul, Pakistan is the one that probably will feel the greatest of pain as a result of this because the flow of refugees 
will be most considerably uh, probably in, in that direction. Beyond that, of course, the Taliban still don't have a any kind of constitution, any kind of uniform policies nationally. It's very, very much locally determined. Uh, there is a struggle between the two major elements of the Taliban, the Haqqani networks, which seems to be in the ascendant in, in Kabul, and has in, installed the Minister of Interior, uh, an individual who has a five or $10 million bounty on his head. Uh, and then the Afghan Taliban, uh, which has the leaders of which have retreated to Kandahar, you see the, the uh, rise of various resistance uh, elements, uh, particularly in the north. And you see the Islamic State, which was fortified substantially by all of the different fighters that were broken out of prison uh, that have been detained previously, <clears throat> now is also drawing, it is attracting some elements, ironically, of the former uh, government forces because they are being pursued by the Taliban. Uh, so it's a little bit not unlike what happened in Syria when we didn't support the moderate opposition adequately. Uh, they decided to go with whomever it was that had resources and was fighting against the Bashar al-Assad regime, and they turned out to be more extreme, certainly in some cases much more extreme uh, than the moderate opposition. So <clears throat> the dynamics in Afghanistan are very, very troubling, very challenging. Uh, and again, that's why I assess this to have been uh, heartbreaking, tragic, and really quite disastrous. So let me, uh, General, try to unpack some of these dynamics. Let me try uh, to take it one, at a, one piece at a time. Uh, did, is the United States leadership so, uh, so tarnished right now that it's not going to be easy to revive the global position of the United States that relies on the commitment of the United States. No. Is this, go ahead, please. No, I don't ahead. think so. Um, I should say though, that I have been uh, a, a, a resumed international travel as I'm sure many on this uh, session have and uh, been in three, for three separate weeks, been in various places in Europe, <clears throat> Warsaw, Rome and London. And I must say that I was quite surprised. I thought I understood how significant the U.S. decision to withdraw from Afghanistan had affected our relationship with our NATO allies that were all members of the coalition, most of which wanted to stay. Uh, but it turned out that the, the bruising, if you will, was even more substantial than I had expected. And then you add into that, of course, the, the uh, AUKUS uh, agreement, which again, uh, so uh, didn't fracture, but it really, again, very substantially bruised the relationship with our longest ally of all, France, without whom we may not have been able to win the revolution, <clears throat> um, that they withdrew their ambassador, um, that he's back, it's all coming back together again. <clears throat> that said, I think, again, this is an administration that has seriously bright people in it. You know them all well from their previous positions. They're back in most cases at a level a bit higher than where they were. Uh, very experienced, very bright. They recognize the damage that has been done, and they mm -hmm. recognize that they handed China an issue that China could then turn to the world and say, see, we told you the U.S. is a country in decline, and we told you that the U.S. is not a dependable power. So, dependable so let me ask you about China. So in that so regard, um, you know, again, they are keenly aware that we must show ourselves to be dependable partners and to be a party uh, in the a country in the ascendant, not in decline. And frankly, this is where the signing yesterday of the $1.2 trillion infrastructure package actually helps. I think the administration is correct in saying that more than ever before, foreign policy begins at home. We had to combat the pandemic. That's yeah. going reasonably well, fits and starts to be sure in various issues, but, but by and large going reasonably well bringing the economy back it's coming roaring back actually in fact the concern is you know how transitory will inflation be or not uh the infrastructure package is done there will be another one that they'll try to get that's much more uncertain and then the real question is can you bring the country back together somewhat so that the foundation on which you uh carry out your foreign policy is more solid than it was uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and and i think that's the right approach that is an you know the correct observation there's I been have, some progress in that regard, but they obviously have some work to do. I have several quick questions, if you don't mind. Hey, on, one China, at a time. on China, uh, is China a, a potentially a beneficiary of what happened in Afghanistan, or is China probably a candidate 
to be yet another great power that falls in the what's so-called Afghanistan graveyard. I don't think China is going to rush right in. They've already had a bad experience in the past. Uh, you may recall that they invested very substantial sums of money in a copper mine just south of Kabul in northern yes. Logar province. Uh, they frankly left it. They they packed up and went home after they were on the receiving end of some rockets and mortar fire. Uh, in fact, during the time, as I recall, that I was the commander. So they're cautious. Uh, they, are, they do not have the kind of uh, economic assistance model that we have where they just give money to countries. They generally loan money to countries as part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to enable countries to build infrastructure that they actually want to see built in a, in a lot of different mm -hmm. ways. They're very cognizant, as are all potential investors around the world, of the extraordinary lithium and rare earths and all the other mineral deposits, copper, everything. Uh, Afghanistan literally has $2 trillion or more of minerals in the ground. The question is, can you actually extract them? Are the, is the human capital, is the physical capital, is the infrastructure, is the know-how, all of this, the lines of communication, uh, and all of that really is not present. And they're very conscious of that. So the idea that they would rush right in and reoccupy or occupy Bagram Air Base or something like that would prove to be uh, wrong, uh, as many of us predicted. They will, watch, they will wait and see. Their biggest concern, keep in mind, is actually not the well-being of Afghanistan. It is the, uh, the emanation of Islamist extremism from Afghanistan. That's what they're most concerned about. And uh, so first and foremost, that will be their thrust. And indeed, they put another base into a neighboring country uh, that is on that finger uh, that juts up out of Afghanistan uh, into Xinjiang. So uh, that I think will be the approach. And they're not, again, eager uh, to get in there at this point in time. They're going to wait and see and, and, and they'll exploit it if they can, as any country should in their position, but not rush in. Right. So, General, there is a theory, and uh, probably you would differ with it, but it says uh, that the United States' departure from Afghanistan is partially, at, at any rate, a, 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 premedita a premeditated step uh, to leave the quagmire of uh, the extremists, the terrorists, the potential fights between Taliban and the Qaeda, and this very vast place called Afghanistan that is quite uncontrollable, that it is a potential quagmire, not only for the Chinese if they come in, but particularly for the Russians. What do you say about that? Oh, I think that's fairly nonsensical, frankly. Uh, the Russians are not gonna rush right in either. They have had, you know, they had a very frustrating experience there. They'd like to be influential. They're going to do more with the Central Asian states. In fact, they just announced some, uh, another measure with one of the Central Asian states, they have sought to regain their influence in the areas that used to be republics during the days of the Soviet Union. Uh, and indeed, there is a very strong affinity between the Central Asian states and, and Moscow. I mean, it, it, it's, it's to Moscow that many of the elite of the Central Asian states go to go shopping or to get medical care or what have you. Um, so, there's long been that affinity and it continues. But again, they also know the challenges of getting trapped in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, the irony for the US is that we could have managed the situation. You can't win it. And I think the challenge was that we were never willing to acknowledge that, you know, I can't give you a timeline if we stay five years, 10 years, 20 years, that we will win and that you can actually walk away and it all stays standing. Uh, that was impossible to, to, to predict or to, uh, to state with any kind of confidence, but keeping 3,500 troops, and you'll recall, I think it was last year, in fact, that I argued for a sustainable, sustained commitment, sustainability being measured in terms of the expenditure of blood and treasure, and we hadn't lost a soldier until that tragic suicide bombing at the entry control point at Kabul International uh, in the previous 18 months. So it seemed to me that was sustainable. Obviously, the decision in Washington, uh, the commander in chief differed, uh, and we are where we are. And again, the, the situation is going to be a very, very punching one uh, you, for those who are on the, on the ground in Afghanistan. Do you worry, General Petraeus, that Taliban uh, either has, uh, will be forced to make a deal with Al-Qaeda or would uh, lose control or lose control of Al-Qaeda activities in the neighborhood and against the United States? 
Well, I think it would be very, very unwise uh, for the Taliban to do any deal with Al Qaeda. And, and I think the Taliban leadership recognize that. Um, the challenge for the Taliban leadership is actually to, to actually govern the country and to provide security for it. I think they are already finding that it is much more difficult to be the counterinsurgent than it is to be the insurgent. Uh, insurgents get to hang out in the hills, also to exploit the sanctuaries that Pakistan has provided all, all over the years for the Afghan Taliban, Haqqani, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, Al-Qaeda, and others in a combination of Baluchistan and the federally administered tribal areas, North Waziristan in particular. Um, and, and again, they can attack at a time and place of their choosing, then retreat back and, and wait until they do it again. Uh, the counterinsurgent, on the other hand, now that the Taliban control the country, uh, they have to secure the entire country. They have to protect all major population centers, all important infrastructure, uh, all bridges, roads that matter, and, and, and the rest. And it is much, much more difficult to do that. Then, by the way, they haven't paid their security forces. Uh, they don't have the funding for it. They don't have the operating costs. And uh, although they they received a lot of weapons and vehicles and so forth uh, when they uh, took the surrender of a variety of Afghan forces, uh, they won't be able to keep these operating over time. So yeah. that is going to be the challenge that they face. You can already see them struggling to secure the country against the Islamic State, which yeah. has been carrying out horrific attacks, often targeting the Shia elements of Afghan society to try to stoke the kind of Shia <coughs> uh, Sunni um, to try to stoke the kind of Shia Sunni strife uh, that, that uh, extremist groups have sought to do in the past. We saw that in Iraq as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're also seeing, frankly, that the um, resistance movement, they really did, the Taliban did not fully control the Panjshir Valley. Uh, in fact, it appears that they have with, retreated from parts, if not all of that, and there are various resistance uh, elements in various locations in northern and central Afghanistan as well. So, so what happens if it's forced to fall time? Uh, and so again, I think they'd be very, very unwise. Keep in mind that one of their objectives has to be to get the $9 billion released to them. Or is that, do you encourage that? Or at least unfrozen with conditions, which is probably the way that you will see this unfold, that there will be a tranche of money that is unfrozen it is funneled through, again, you pick it, World Food Program or one of the other international organizations that will say, we can provide assistance directly to the Afghan people without empowering the Taliban. Because again, you, the domestic political situation in the US is not going to allow us to recognize or, di or directly fund the Taliban. Uh, yeah. And that's understandable uh, and, and, and correct. So these are the kinds of, this is the context in which all of this is going to play out. And once again, I think you're going to see that the Taliban who are trying to rule a country that is very, very different from the one that they governed so ineptly in you know, the, the previous time, uh, this is much tougher now than it was even then. So let me ask you about another uh, neighbor, uh, whether that neighbor is going to be a winner or a loser from the developments in Afghanistan, and I have in mind Iran. Well, Iran um, has always had a, a, a bit of an oar in the water in Afghanistan. It has supported to some degree uh, certain elements of the Taliban that are operating in the provinces most contiguous to Iran. Um, there is economic uh, uh, activity, certainly a good bit of trade, particularly in the western part of the country uh, in the area west of Herat. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Afghanistan does import refined fuel products uh, from Iran. But by and large, I don't think Iran is going to be affected as much. It will be affected. It will have refugee flows. That has always been a case, even in, in good times, and these will not be good times. So you will see more refugees heading there than in the past. But I think the bulk of those refugees will probably end up going to Pakistan uh, rather than to Iran. And the Central Asian states, by and large, are going to resist large numbers of refugees. They have been, and you got a pretty substantial river that defines a good bit of the border uh, between Afghanistan and those states to its north. Um, so I, again, I, I, Iran will seek also to support the Shia elements uh, inside uh, Afghanistan. It will have a relationship with Afghanistan. It will be present uh, in, in Kabul very likely. But 
I think the effect on Iran will be much, much less than the effect on Pakistan, which is going yeah. to be the country that will really feel the brunt of the outflow uh, mm -hmm. of refugees when this, this real privation beyond where they are already, which is very, very dire, but as that really sets in. Iran's sight is probably set more on uh, Iraq than on Afghanistan, uh, given the- well, Iraq, Syria, war. Lebanon, uh, Yemen, you know, a yes. few other locations. Yeah, right. no, so, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Shia Crescent has always been seen as being to the west of Iran, not to the east of Iran necessarily. Yeah. Although, as I mentioned, there is a relationship uh, that does exist uh, between Iran and certain elements of the Taliban and certainly the Shia community. Right, so that Shiite Crescent or the Farsi Crescent, however you want to call it, um, it's, in the, it's not only in the making, it's really made some strides, uh, I would uh, argue, uh, from Iraq through uh, Syria, Lebanon, we'll talk about that again, unpack it one by one. Iraq, uh, it's, what, what, what do you expect after this, we're told that there would be a serious American exit from Iraq? You know much more than I would on this of, of, of the situation in Iraq and the fact uh, that uh, is, Iran is very much involved in the internal politics in Iraq right now, from the uh, elections challenged by the allies of Iraq of Iran, uh, challenging the results of the elections in Iraq, and uh, to some people uh, saying that there may be a relationship. Uh, between Iran and some of the mm, local uh, uh, extremists in, in, in Iraq, uh, that they have a hand in the attempt of assassination of the Prime Minister uh, Mustafa Kazimi. Can you talk to us about that? Well, first of all, what the US is doing is, um, in a sense, ending the quote combat mission uh, that it has had in Iraq. Now, in truth, it hasn't been engaged in combat operations for quite some time with a handful of exceptions, um, supporting Iraqi counter-terrorist operations, uh, helping Iraq keep an eye on the Islamic State elements that are still sadly present and still sadly carry out attacks. The most recent attack, which really did seek to foment, again, violence between Sunni and Shia uh, is particularly alarming uh, northeast of, uh, of uh, uh, Baghdad. But, uh, this is not a massive change. The U.S. will stay. It will continue to provide a variety of assistance to, uh, again, in particular, the Iraqi security forces that are focused on uh, Islamist extremists and, and perhaps presumably on uh, some of the Iranian activities that go on there as well. Uh, look, Iraq always has been for forthright in saying they have to have a relationship with their big neighbor uh, to their east. Uh, but they don't want to become, in, in US analogy, the 51st state uh, of Iran. And they have resisted that pretty effectively. Uh, the good news, I think, of recent months is that in the election that took place for the Council of Representatives, the Iraqi parliament, uh, the Iranian supported parties did not do well. Uh, and the party of Muqtad al-Sadr, someone with whom we've had differences, to put it mildly, over the years, but nonetheless is much more of a nationalist than an Iranian surrogate the way some of the other uh, political parties and the associated militias are. Uh, he did very, very well and is really in the in the prime minister maker, the king maker seat. Uh, prime Minister Kadami, who I think very highly of, who is who is a man without a party, uh, who was the intelligence chief and very highly respected in that position, um, was in Washington recently. In fact, a number of us, I met with him uh, during that time. Uh, he is one of the three on a list that could be the prime minister, depending on what coalition is put together. Right. I think that could be very positive uh, for Iraq. Again, the Iraqis know that Iran wants to Lebanonize it. It wants to do the same thing in Baghdad that it's been able to do in Beirut, which is to achieve a veto-proof majority in the Council of Representatives, uh, and also to have a lot of street muscle to back up whatever it is that they want to do. And we've seen that street muscle deployed. And of course, this drone attack on the Iraqi White House uh, right. was one manifestation of it, as have been the various demonstrations and so forth. But I think the Iraqi security forces will prove capable of dealing with that. They've actually shown a good deal of uh, restraint, uh, but also firmness. And that's what they need to do. They need to be firm, not needlessly provocative. 
as the process of government formation goes forward. And my hope would be that we could see the very good combination of the current president uh, and also the current prime minister continue. And that ideally you'd see a few less of the less competent uh, ministers of, of the various ministries while retaining some of those that are competent and have demonstrated the professional expertise uh, that one would really want in those ministries uh, so that the Iraqi government for the first time can actually provide its people the kind of competent governance, the kind of basic services, the kind of legislation and all the rest of that uh, that they have really not been able to provide even though they have had, I think this is now the sixth maybe peaceful transition of power, which in and of itself is not, not trivial uh, in the Middle East. But hope, hopefully, again, touch wood, inshallah, uh, and so forth, that the uh, land of the two rivers can see more competent governance. And of course, they're buoyed at this point in time as well uh, by the price of Brent crude that is still over $80 a barrel, which is a huge plus for them, even if it may be a negative for climate change. With, with the withdrawal of the American interest uh, from at least the extent that it used to be uh, from Iraq, and I will also uh, ask you about Syria, because there is at least, uh, you, you said that there would be a stay, but not the stay of the past. I, I, I didn't, that doesn't cover Syria. I think Syria is an entirely different oh, situation. We'll get, we'll get to Syria. Although, again, what we're doing there is very much still supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, and then just over, overseeing the refugee camp at Al-Taf. So I, I think there's a keen awareness. By the way, keep in mind what I said very early on, and I'm glad you brought out the point that, you know, is the U.S. a dependable partner uh, question is a crucial question, because it's what hinges deterrence, for example, the most important relationship in the world is that between the U.S. and its allies and partners and China. The most important element of that is to avoid conflict. Uh, the way you avoid conflict is by deterrence. Deterrence is a function of an adversary's perception, a potential adversary's perception of your capabilities and your willingness to employ them. Our dependability as a partner is wrapped up in that willingness to deploy them. And those in Washington know that the withdrawal from Afghanistan did call into question somewhat just as, by the way, you'll recall the red line in Syria that was not a red line also had reverberations around the world. The, the statement that Bashar al-Assad must go and then we don't make him go has reverberations. They are keenly aware of that. And, and, one, and by the way, one reason that AUKUS came out so quickly after the withdrawal was just to show that, you know, we are we're still engaged. We are engaged in new initiatives, new endeavors. So in that case, um, I, I think, again, the U.S. is going to go to pains to show that it is still very much engaged. It is a dependable partner uh, because we have to, in a sense, reassure uh, allies and partners around the world, some of whom were quite upset uh, that we basically informed them what we were going to do on Afghanistan rather than truly consulting and discussing uh, with them how we were going to do it. I just want to really just have a number of clarifications I want uh, to ask you about kindly. Can you tell me like how big is the withdrawal or the stay of the U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria and just in, because we're talking about U.S. forces. Can you just tell me what are you projecting? How do you read where the Biden administration is going with this? I think it's a, it's a pretty modest uh, reduction of forces uh, in Iraq. It's more, again, about the missions that they're going to perform in the future, uh, which will not be combat missions. They will be more train and equip, advise and assist, and in some cases, enable uh, Iraqi security force members, particularly as they keep an eye on the Islamic State and any other Islamist extremists, uh, so, where it's in, in our mutual interest. And uh, Syria, I don't know if plans to draw down in Syria. I think the, the inclination in Syria is to figure out how can you sustain what we have. Again, there's a keen awareness. If we withdraw our, our again, training, equipping, advising, assisting, and enabling of the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, that those forces will be under enormous pressure from many different directions, from the regime, also from uh, our NATO ally, Turkey, uh, and certainly from within, if you will, by the Islamic State. Well, let's talk about Syria, and then I may want to go back to Iraq a little bit, but let's talk about Syria since we are there. Uh, the impression is that uh, Bashar al-Assad is back. 
back with the help of a lot of players, certainly Russia first, because that is the, the Russia's pre uh, eminent uh, um, area in, 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 the, in the Middle East that it cares about. But also you'll see like King Abdullah of Jordan is normalizing with and pushing for the normalization with Syria. You see that the Biden administration is allowing some exemptions uh, of the, um, uh, the Caesars Act, which is the law of the Congress, but uh, whether it is through uh, visits or whether it is through the uh, electric uh, uh, route that is being approved from uh, Egypt through Jordan, through Syria to Lebanon under the, uh, the notion that this is for humanitarian aid, aid in Lebanon, but it is an exemption of the Caesars Act. And uh, he, uh, Bashar al-Assad seems to be very well in his skin uh, that uh, you know the region and the United States are saying, well, uh, if he's back, we're gonna adjust. What do you say, General Petreos? Well, there have been uh, some incremental actions in that regard. And I think you probably could have included some Emirati outreach uh, in mm -hmm. recent weeks, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, as well as part of that. Uh, and clearly there is a reassessment going on. Um, certainly the assessment of a number of years ago that Bashar al-Assad was teetering on the throne proved uh, inaccurate, largely because again, Russia came in and stabilized him there. Uh, and there are clearly efforts that are designed to try to reduce Iranian influence uh, in Syria. Yeah, you will have seen that Bashar made some uh, statement, you know, an, an IRGC commander what had to be withdrawn from Syrian soil. That's a big deal. Now, what's going on there is you have another element in this, uh, which is becoming more prominent, and that is the evolution of the relationships fostered by the Abraham Accords. Uh, and Israel obviously is very concerned about Iranian beachheads uh, in, uh, in in Syria. Uh, it has been attacking them. It's been announced all that. It's all been very public. Uh, but again, very, very concerned about certain uh, industries and so forth that Iran has tried to establish there and manufacturing plants or assembly plants or what have you that would have uh, dire consequences for Israel. Uh, and so with their new relationship, uh, of course, with the Emiratis, with the Bahrainis, uh, and really also some others behind the scenes uh, that you can imagine, um, you are starting to see some of these kinds of initiatives of, you know, so it's more than triangular, it's multi-sided, yes. uh, if you will, um, but that is yet another uh, of the factors present here of how do you marginalize Iran? And so the question is, what is your priority? Is it that Bashar al-Assad must go or is it that Iran must go? Uh, and if the priority is that Iran must go, then uh, again, you might be more willing to allow him. But again, from a U.S. perspective, our uh, concern, needless to say, first and foremost, still probably is the Islamic State remnants, because what, the reason we went into Syria at the end of the day was because of the Islamic State caliphate that was established and the threat that it posed to the Kurdish regional government capital, even to the Iraqi capital uh, at one point in time, and certainly to our NATO uh, allies and partners in Europe. Um, that has been eliminated. Uh, Islamic State has been defeated, but there are many, many remnants of the Islamic State. And of course, those very large refugee camps, tragically, are incubators of extremism uh, that, that we've been unable to resolve because countries don't want their citizens back from those Locations. That's on the one hand understandable, but on the other hand, very frustrating. So you have all of these different factors and dimensions uh, that are present. Uh, and if the primary one now that is that is emerging as the top priority is marginalize Iran, then maybe you you pursue some of these initiatives that you have seen uh, in recent days, but without necessarily saying that we're going to push the Syrian Democratic Forces to cut a deal. With the central government. And I, and I don't know, by the way, necessarily that it envisions Bashar remaining forever either. You know well that there are various schemes for uh, replacements and, and various current ones, current that. ones, current schemes right now. Well, I, and again, I'm not talking about government schemes, I'm talking more about sort of conceptual ideas that individuals have had about, uh, you know, how, the, how you could go for it. And that's been ongoing for years, actually. Yeah. 
So let me let me take something that's very interesting to me. I even wrote about it in my last column, actually, uh, and, and I'm very curious about your thoughts on that. So if we take a look of the process of normalization with uh, Israel under the Abrams Accords with several Arab countries, and some are apparently looking into it as well. So we have about six countries. And then you put that together with the normalization process that's going on with Syria's Bashar al-Assad um, at the same time. Do you find a, a relationship between the two that's A and B, do you think uh, that Iran would be a loser actually as a result of that or will be brought in and Hezbollah in particular, will Hezbollah lose its uh, raison d'etre if uh, this relationship produces a result that is the normalization with Syria on one hand and the normalization with Israel. Please go ahead. Well, look, first of all, I think when you talk about Hezbollah, you have to talk about Lebanon and you have to talk about Iran's effort again to Lebanonize Lebanon. In other words, to again achieve the kind of political clout that they have achieved in the Lebanese parliament, uh, in the influence that they have in governmental affairs and the street muscle uh, that Hezbollah uh, can generate as well. Now, some of that has been tarnished uh, as a result of a variety of different calamities that Lebanon has experienced and also some of the violence and et cetera, but not, not sufficiently in my view, unfortunately. Um, Hezbollah much less, I think, invested, if you will, in Syria they were there because Iran said, look, we fund you guys, get in there and prop up Bashar al-Assad and get on the front lines in some cases and, and try to avoid uh, his, help him avoid defeat. Um, they took a lot of casualties on that, as you know. It was not that, that uh, popular among uh, the mothers of Hezbollah soldiers, certainly, uh, who saw their sons come home in caskets. So I don't, and, and they have gradually reduced what it was that they were doing there. So I think I would disconnect the Hezbollah interest uh, in, in Syria from all of this and, and focus it really on what they're doing uh, in Lebanon and their, their always uh, present desire to cause problems and uh, destruction in, in but, Israel. But my question was about the interrelationship between the two processes of normalization with Israel on one hand, with Syria on the other hand. Well, the, the other one is, is much more prominent, I think. And that is, again, where you see the intersection of the Abraham Accords um, where Israel very, very much, and rightly, and we and every, a lot of different countries want to reduce Iran's influence in Syria. Uh, again, Iran would love to Lebanonize Syria as well. It's a little bit uh, different circumstance, needless to say, uh, but they would like to have the kind of political influence and street muscle there that would give them a, a sense of control that they have to a degree, of course, in, in Lebanon, particularly southern Lebanon. Because again, obviously, the Shia Crescent stretches from uh, Iran through Iraq, central Iraq, if you will, uh, Syria, and then down into southern Lebanon. That's right. And we want to solidify that in any way that we can. So again, obviously, that's what they're trying to do. And Israel wants to avoid that, as do the other uh, Arab nations of the region. Uh, and those that are part of the Abraham Accords are discussing that directly. Those that are not are probably doing it indirectly and behind the scenes. Yeah. And you but see the impression these is general that, that are being pursued. Yeah, the impression is general is that actually, and you know, you may want to challenge this completely, is that Iran is actually winning in establishing that crescent. Uh, it, it, it has control, substantial control in Iraq. It has... Uh, quite a lot of influence in Syria, and it has practically full control of Lebanon. And the notion is that now with the JCPOA, with the nuclear deal being discussed, and they say about to be done, uh, the impression is that this is going to, uh, to, to embolden Iran, uh, to, to, to strengthen Iran, rather than to reduce its influence or to cut off its plans for the Crescent. Well, no, I would challenge that. I think if I mentioned uh, it has suffered some setbacks uh, in Iraq in the election. Uh, that outcome was certainly not what they had hoped for. Uh, they had wanted to solidify, again, the grasp that their parties have uh, in the parliament, and that did not take place. In fact, it solidified their major Shia opponent, 
the party of Muqtada al-Sadr and the coalition that he can probably put together, which will not include, one would imagine, the Iranian-supported parties and associated militias, which is very positive for Iraq um, and for the Iraqis, and I would say for us and uh, the Arab states as well. Again, it's not done. Uh, there are lots of challenges and hurdles and so forth that uh, Iraq has to get over uh, in the weeks that lie ahead in the government formation process. Then they have to actually get it uh, through the Council of Representatives, uh, get the ministers seated and all the rest of this. But, mm -hmm. but again, that is a, that's positive in my view, not negative. Uh, and then I would argue that in, in Syria, you know, very modest um, positive uh, actions with respect to reducing Iranian influence. Now, again, that if your premise is that the number one objective is to reduce Iranian influence, and, and as I have noted, there are some other pretty substantial objectives that we have there as well. Uh, Russians would want that as well, General? Want, what's that? The, Russia, the Russians would want that to reduce Iranian influence in Syria from your point of view? Um, again, there will be some, uh, probably an inclination in that direction, not, not enough to undermine Bashar al-Assad. Uh, but again, keep in mind that Russia's primary interest is to keep him on the throne, keep that That's regime right. in charge as a client state of theirs that buys their weapons and all the rest of this. Um, and so again, from their perspective, and oh, by the way, they have some relations with, um, of course, the, some of the countries in the region and uh, both Arab and, and Israel. So again, this is a really complicated uh, yeah. uh, mix of factors when it comes to Syria. And therefore there's a number of different combinations and permutations that could come out of that. But, and it depends what, how you rack and stack your priorities in terms of the objectives relative to Iran or the Islamic State or Bashar or Russia or Turkey or what have you. I have 10 minutes and I have to, millions of things to ask you about, including uh, the, what Iran do we expect in the post, uh, if it happens, the JCPOA. But I want to focus on Lebanon because you kindly um, brought that up. And then, then I want to speak about Turkey and the Gulf. So and we're going to have to be a bit quicker So on Lebanon. Uh, we have uh, an impression here as I sit in Lebanon is that the world has just sort of deserted this country and uh, just agrees to give it to Iran and, 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 and to leave it in the hands of Hezbollah. And as you know, not even an investigation can be uh, performed. Uh, the judiciary is being aborted. Uh, the, even the man who's in charge of, uh, in, you know, the, the judge who's been appointed to do the investigation is, 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 is the man who's like, right now being attacked and they're gonna want to bring him down. And we don't feel there's enough support from the United States in particular for this country called Lebanon. First, do you think it's, it's enough support and why don't we see more? And secondly, what happens if you lose Lebanon, if we lose Lebanon? So well, Iran, I, don't what, I, first of, I don't even know what lose Lebanon means. Uh, to Iran and Hezbollah. Again, Hezbollah is what it is. It's not going to win or lose. It's going to retain a foothold. It's. I mean, look, the, the tragedy is that Lebanon is either now or on the threshold of being a failed state. Uh, and the frustration with the governing elite, I think is legitimate and real. You even see, of course, the kingdom has uh, backed away from Lebanon, which used to be a big supporter. Is that, uh, is that, not, is that good or bad? I mean, even that when no, the it, meets, and it, even it, Lebanon. It was a source of big revenue um, of, of, of support and when any support is withdrawn, obviously it makes it more difficult uh, for those who are trying to just keep the lights on. Uh, I Lebanon. mean, is the decision right or wrong, General? I mean to say, is this a wise decision to like uh, just wash your hands of this country on the long run? I mean, I know that- Yeah, I don't think anybody has washed their hands. I don't think people have washed their hands of Lebanon. I think people have tried to demonstrate uh, the enormous amount of frustration uh, with the actions of the governing elite. And they're just not going, and this is by no means just the US or just Gulf states or just Europeans or just, it's everybody is absolutely frustrated uh, with the Lebanese elite governing class who have made such a hash of the situation there. Uh, and, you know, this entire uh, Ponzi scheme that was the financial system there has obviously collapsed. You have the ports blown up. 
Um, you have a, it, 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 you know, declining basic services, the currency is in free fall. I mean, every aspect of the country, tragically, because I'd love to see it. And there, you know, there are so many great qualities there and so many blessings, but they have largely been squandered by a governing elite that is basically uh, divvying up various elements of the pie for their mm. constituents. And yeah. uh, I think the world is trying to tell Lebanon, if you continue to do that, we're not going to continue to underwrite that. Right. And so I, don't, I, don't that. I don't find that illogical. I don't yeah. find that you know necessarily wrong. I share that frustration. Look, I was the guy. You know, we supported the Lebanese Armed Forces, which is the one element that I would submit is still really re, you know professional and competent and dependable. Right. Um, but it, it is so maddening uh, to see all of the support that is provided basically not turn into basic services mm -hmm. and infrastructure and all the rest of that for the Lebanese people. It's a given, and the Lebanese people agree with you 100%. It's just, how is the collapse of a country a logical thing to stand by and let happen when it is on the borders of Syria, on the borders of uh, Israel, and when it is really a country uh, that is, you know, it has its own place in history as well. What, why sure. is the collapse a good solution? Just well, I don't, I don't think the collapse is a good solution. Because, you know, because, you know, because, because, you know the, the, the Lebanese people are, are really paying the price of their uh, uh, ruling elites, of the Hezbollah control, of the geopolitics uh, and in general, of the regional equation. Uh, what, what to do about it? it? A collapse is not an answer, General Petraeus. Well, I agree with you. The answer is for the governing elite to finally get serious about uh, undertaking reforms, which is what the people are demanding as well. But I think that the, country, the, the countries of the, of the world are not going to continue to pour resources uh, into a system that funnels those resources into the pockets of the political constituencies that these different entities represent, yeah. uh, unless there is a sense of real reform. And that's just a reality. That is the context uh, in which this is playing out. But not, we don't want to see a collapse. We, that's not what uh, the, the desirable outcome. But unless there is reform, uh, you can't pull that country back from where it is. And so the challenge is going to be that the elite finally is going to have to come to grips with the need for reform. Yeah. If they cannot, if they cannot, then you'll see a continued exodus of uh, citizens from Lebanon, tragically. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid to tell you that that's not going to happen. They're not going to let go. Unfortunately, I, I know them, I see them, I know what they're doing, and uh, unfortunately, I have bad news for you. They're not going to reform, and not, they're not going to give up their power. Anyway, I need to move on to other things. Unfortunately, I'd like to stay with Lebanon, but it's not possible. You have no time to do that. Uh, Yemen, is it being uh, at least discussed in a way, on its way to a resolution in the conversations that are taking place between the Saudis and the Iranians from your point of view? Do you know anything about that? What do you see on Yemen? Well, the problem in Yemen, from my perspective, from the very beginning, has been the Houthis. Uh, the Houthis did not get, get what they wanted uh, in the election a number of years back. Uh, they decided to demonstrate. They still didn't get what they wanted, so they decided to invade Sana'a, basically. Uh, ran the elected government out of Sana'a, then ran them out of the entire country, much to the surprise of, of the supporters of that government. Uh, and you've had a situation ever since then uh, where the Houthi just have not been willing to discuss. Yes, there have been lots of tragic, terrible uh, cases of uh, civilian uh, loss uh, on the side of Houthis um, and, and on both sides, certainly, without question. But, mm -hmm. but all of this, again, if the Houthis are not serious, and I, th I fear that right now, especially with the evacuation very recently in the port of Hodeida, um, that they feel that they are getting what they need on the on the battlefield. Why should they give in on the in the world of diplomacy? So mm -hmm. the special representative and others are are trying to negotiate from a position uh, that is not as strong as one would hope. Um, and again, here you again you have a frustration of those that were supporting uh, the legitimate government, uh, or if you will, the elected government. Uh, with what that government and its forces have done. Uh, and another case that is, you know, a failed state already, and whether you can put it back together again or how you put it back together 
uh, I think, very much in question. But if the Houthis are not willing uh, to negotiate and if they continue to attack uh, the Saudis in the way that, that they have, uh, I see very little prospect for a, a good outcome there. Unfair as it will be, not maybe, I need you to give me one minute for each of these following uh, dossiers, if you will. Uh, the, Palest the Palestinian question, Palestine. Is it written off or do you think? I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I don't think it is okay. at all written off. It's just that the context, the conditions are not present. By the way, on either side, especially on the Palestinian side, uh, with whom would you negotiate? Who actually represents the Palestinians at this point in time? Um, it, you know, why are they pursuing these crazy policies where they, you know, the pay for slay kind of thing that just plays into the hands of, uh, of, of, of critics of the Palestinians? So again, um, I think the Palestinian political situation is even is considerably less propitious uh, for any kind of agreement uh, than, frankly, is even the Israeli side, which actually got a budget passed. Uh, the coalition, you know, contrary to the projections of many, you think uh, the Abrams Accord will be in the final analysis good for the Palestinians? Well, it actually did forestall an action that was contemplated and yeah, annexation. Yeah. So, I mean, that in that sense, I mean, that was a very significant. Uh, action. And that was the part of the reason, of course, that uh, Ambassador Yusuf actually published that op-ed in the Jerusalem Post. Mm -hmm. um, and that turned out to be a catalyst for what evolved into the Abraham Accords. Libya, one minute on each of these things. I, I beg your pardon to talk well, about touch, touch, touch wood on Libya that we can get through the elections, that you can get more of the uh, external forces out of there. Uh, that you could actually have a coming together and, and that there would be a recognition and acceptance of the results of the election and you could bring the country uh, again into a more united position. Again, I'd touch all, all wood and sight on that. But, but it, is, it is moving. Again, it, it is more positive certainly uh, than negative in, in recent months. Saif al-Islam al-Qadhafi nominated uh, himself uh, for president. <laughs> You know, the name, there's name recognition, certainly. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it at that. Sudan. Oh, gosh. Uh, again, such a, another tragic situation where you have, again, is the military really going to give up, take its hands off the reins, really transition? Um, and of course, our envoy has been out there and also out there in you know, Ethiopia would be another one that we could mention uh, in, in that particular region. Yeah. Uh, both of these really tragic situations where just even, you know, a year or two ago, uh, in each case, there was a, a degree of hope. Um, and I hope we can get back on track in, in Sudan. Obviously, the people are going to suffer as a result of this. Uh, and then in Ethiopia, the, the tragic situation there of a country that had the brightest prospects in all of Africa among the four large countries, the four large economies, uh, and, you know, just a few years ago, the prime minister was a unifier and a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and now he is uh, uh, imprisoning Germany. Again, it's just a tragic situation. Turkey, is, uh, is, is Turkey uh, going to be a strategic loser or survivor? Well, certainly the, I mean, the, the economy of Turkey, which is something we really need to focus on, has obviously suffered in recent years as, for, as a variety of uh, different policies have been pursued that have uh, made it less of a, an investment de destination, uh, have devalued the currency. I mean, again, it, the, the situation there has uh, become, uh, again, much more negative from a perception uh, of those that might invest there. And that's tragic for that country and our, and our NATO ally of many, many decades. Mm. Robert Malley, the envoy of uh, the Biden administration, is in the region, in the Gulf region, I think probably in preparation for the talks, uh, the resumption of the talks in Vienna on the 29th, and what people think is a done deal on the JCPOA. Address both things for me. The Gulf reaction, the Gulf states, where do they sit now on this? And will there be a, a JCPOA, a new JCPOA? But where, where are your bets on this one? Well, first of all, let's recognize that Iran is closer to having uh, enough weapons grade uranium for a nuclear device, probably closer in terms of its knowledge, certainly many, many more medium range uh, missiles, 
than it was before the previous JCPOA. And remember how concerned we were then. Remember that there was a sense then that they were within months of actually the potential breakout or the potential development of a nuclear device. They're much closer now. They have 60% enriched uranium, not just 20%. Of course, weapons grade is roughly 90%. Uh, they have assembled again, much, much more low enriched and all the rest of this. So uh, the context is even more concerning. And of course, even if you return to the JCPOA, it's not the JCPOA that it was in the beginning when all the sunset clauses were 10, 12, 15, whatever years away. Uh, now they're four or five again and so forth uh, years away, history? which is why of course they were always saying we're gonna go longer and stronger. And now it appears that they'll be lucky just to get back to the JCPOA. So I think there is legitimate concern in the Gulf uh, that all of this could break down somehow, that there could be some kind of uh, something that results in actual conflict. I think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, and certainly the US and, and those on, mm. on our side have to be uh, considering what is it that we actually do uh, in the event that you cannot get back uh, to some kind of negotiated outcome here. And, and what if perspectives well, would, would be that's absolutely that's absolutely necessary to have that plan B, but also it looks like with the lifting of sanctions that will come around, uh, uh, come along with uh, agreement. What sort of Iran do you see? Do you see the Iran emboldened and strong and so saying, I am going to complete that project of, of mine that you called the Shiite Crescent or the Farsi uh, uh, Crescent? Uh, not necessarily, actually. I see them a bit on the back foot. Um, you have a harder line government, certainly, that as a result of the election and the new officials who are in power, um, but they can't feel emboldened by what has happened in Iraq or by what they're seeing happen in Syria or even by what they're seeing. With the lifting of sanctions, uh, General, I, I, meant, I meant with the lifting of sanctions if there is a deal with Iran. That's what I meant. Well, again, depends what's lifted, what does it do for their economy? Uh, what does it enable them to export in terms of oil? Um, and by the way, they have to be very careful that we don't actually um, turn the screws tighter uh, on some aspects of what it is they're able to do right now, such as exporting to China. Um, mm. Keep in mind how hard we turned the screws prior to the JCPOA uh, mm. and the effect that it had on them uh, and again, by coming back to the negotiations, of course, you get China and Russia uh, back inside the tent, all together with the US and the other permanent members, uh, plus the EU. Uh, and so you could actually have more united action if, if, again, Russia and China all get frustrated with Iran as well. Uh, the military, I have to ask you as a military uh, commander, uh, with the military maneuvers that are taking place or have taken place, uh, uh, one on one hand by, on the, by the Iranians, on the other hand by for the first time the Israelis, the Emiratis, yep. the Bahrainis. Yep. Address yep. that to me for me, please. Go ahead. And tell well, again, me. it's very significant. Uh, all of this is an outgrowth of the Abraham Accords. I mean, you just keep seeing the, the ever ever more steps. And by the way, involving <laughs> other countries that are not members of the Abraham Accords, but are supportive from outside of what's going on. Um, and so it's fascinating to see these. Uh, it's fascinating to see Israel at the, the Dubai Air Show. It's fascinating. Again, all of this is, uh, again, uh, really quite striking. And it should give concern to Iran. Because again, if, if the primary objective of so many countries is to, to limit Iran, uh, to counter its malign influence, uh, to react to its medium missile threat, I mean, wouldn't it be something now if all of a sudden we could finally achieve what we sought to achieve all the way back from when I was the Central Command Commander, which would be a, a truly integrated uh, ballistic missile and anti-aircraft uh, warning and defense system among all the Gulf states? Uh, because again, if the primary concern is Iran, you'd finally do that as opposed to your primary concern is another member of the GCC, which you know those tensions have been reduced as well. They're not completely gone, but it's positive to see the development, certainly between the Emiratis, the Saudis, and the Qataris. Chair Petraeus, I'm sure you saw the uh, story by the New York Times about how the U.S. had uh, um, had hit an airstrike. The article that said uh, that air in Syria, uh, alleged, well, stating that that airstrike killed dozens of civilians in Syria. 
and that the U.S. had hit that. Is this embarrassing for the U.S. military? Well, I, as you may recall, I've always noted that on the wall of the operations center, when I was a commander, and, and of course I was a commander uh, of five different organizations actually in combat, starting as a two-star, then a three-star, four-star, 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 um, that we always had a sign on the operations center that was staring at you as you're contemplating actions. And it asked, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And if something does the opposite or would seem to do the opposite as you are assessing the results of it, then you are supposed to go sit under a tree until the thought passes. You know, I haven't, I don't know the details of all of this. If it is as reported, uh, then obviously it, that's a, a pretty negative uh, uh, revelation. The last word is about, the last word I'm going to give you, if you permit me, is something about you wrote about, but uh, it's called the future of geopolitics. It's a huge, uh, it's, it's something we will probably discuss at the Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi in March, God willing. Uh, and uh, uh, it's always about the geopolitics. How do they impact not only the countries, but the peoples and the individuals and and, and you know, uh, uh, it, it's not the traditional sense of geopolitics, as you well know. It's, it's about the new types of geopolitics. What should we be thinking about when we hear, when we want to think what General Petraeus is thinking about the future of geopolitics? Well, it, you know, when you ask a question like that, um, I always revert to what, you know, I was a professor of economics at one point in time. And you you always answer every question starting by saying it depends and it, it you know, the future of geopolitics does depend very very much i mean first and foremost it depends on the success of the current u.s government keep in mind again i'm non-political i don't i don't register vote support contribute and i, I advise candidates of either power uh, party and i had senior positions two on each under republican and democrat uh, so it depends how successful is the u.s uh, in combating the pandemic, bringing back the economy, uh, investing in infrastructure that improves productivity of American workers, and bringing the country together. Uh, and the jury is out on that. There have been some modest steps forward in that regard, particularly the signing yesterday of the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which is not modest. That's big. That's something that eluded every previous government as long as I can remember, particularly certainly the Obama and also Trump uh, governments, you know, President Trump had infrastructure week repeatedly. We never had infrastructure signing at the White House as we did yesterday. And then the, what is the prospect for the follow on, which is more of a social uh, package, but includes uh, some considerable investment in human capital. So that's Washington. What about Beijing? Uh, it's yeah. pretty clear that, that uh, especially with the result of the six party plenum, that President Xi is going to be, he's elevated to a level that is a, you know, really only a achieved in the past by Mao and, and Deng Xiaoping to a degree. Uh, he will be reelected presumably in October 2022 for a third five-year term with the prospect perhaps even of another five years after that. What is the decision-making in Beijing? Uh, yeah. Is it going to be a bit more cooperative, uh, more constructive, more mutually beneficial, or will it be uh, again, something that is uh, much more competitive or what have you. And again, so it depends. And all of this, I would say that the lesson of the pandemic that we should take, I'm not sure we have completely, but what we should be taking from the pandemic uh, is the recognition that you have to work together, uh, that no country is safe. With, no of, none of us are safe without all of us being safe. Uh, and that you do have to work together. You do have to share. You do have to help those who are less fortunate. All the rest of this stuff, uh, I think, is very, very essential. And I hope that that is a lesson that comes out of this. There was some degree of progress, uh, you know, in the COP uh, that, that was just concluded in Glasgow. Can that be built on? Because, of course, certainly the, the defining feature of the Biden administration, a big point of difference between it and the previous U.S. government is, of course, that it has re-engaged in a variety of international fora, uh, which from which we had withdrawn. Paris Climate Accord being one, uh, the WHO being another, a variety of others in which we're re-engaged. Um, I tend to agree with that. I think that, again, American leadership does matter. Um, and I'm hopeful that America can be in a position that it enables it to continue to provide 
that leadership together with our partners and allies around the world, and that we're not withdrawing, by the way, from your region, from our region, if you will, from the Middle East. We are certainly rebalancing, to, to, but it's not a pivot away. It is a reduction in some respects of some capabilities but with very, very significant continuing interests. And those interests are real and present, and they will keep us engaged very much in that region, I think, in a very substantial fashion. General Petraeus, it is always an honor to uh, have a conversation with you. It's always enlightening and uh, you leave us optimistic despite all the difficulties. Thank you for this distinct privilege that I have, that I have this Always a pleasure. Thank Sharaf. you. And I have Shukran Jazeela. Thank you, Shukran Jazeela. And I want to thank Jean-Duc Anthony for this really Likewise. honestly fantastic uh, opportunity you give us, both General uh, Petraeus and myself, to be part of your uh, conference and congratulations on the 30th anniversary. And uh, I just want to tell you, I'm really humbled by this opportunity. See you in Abu Dhabi for Beirut Institute Summit, because this conversation continues from Washington to the Arab region. And I hope we always are able to speak and we always uh, can try to be constructive. I thank you both very much. Over to you, Jean-Duc Anthony. Thank you both. Um, we're lucky to have each of you as members of our International Advisory Board <clears throat> and that we have made it as far as we have the 30 years for this annual conference, which is unlike any uh, of which I have knowledge uh, elsewhere on the, on the planet. And our overall 38 years of existence since we were established in 1983. 